Supreme Grace in Matthew 18 19. Real quick. Matthew 18, verse 19 says this. We're going to pray here in just a second. Yeah, we got it. It says again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Who said that? All right, what's the requirement? It says again, I say unto you, that if two of you agree, we got more than two of us, right? Yeah. And we're going to be in agreement, be in unity. We're going to be in unity and agreement based on the word. On earth is touching anything that they shall ask. Shall be done for them, my Father, which is in heaven. Some of you guys may know. I call her Granny, but most of y'all, Miss Niecy or, or Janice Waller, she's not here this morning because she's up here in Marion and I see you. On um, Thursday, many of you guys seen Facebook and all that kind of stuff, and, and, I, and we talked about it and prayed for a Thursday night. But on Thursday morning, she was taken to the emergency room, and they initially thought it was a perforated ulcer, but made long story short, up until this point, it was a, a colon. Her colon had a hole in it and had been leaking into her body. So, uh, again, she had more than the doctors even this morning. She had a pretty rough night last night. We want to lift her up in prayer uh, now, uh, this morning, before we get started. She had a rough night last night, but was doing better this morning. They've had to put her back on oxygen, uh, not the ventilator, not just the little thing with the face mask and all. Some of you nurses and people in the medical field know more about that than me. But the doctor said this morning what her biggest issue was is that she didn't have one issue, that she had four or five issues. One of them was the double pneumonia, and then she's had this surgery on Thursday, and she needs the pain medication for the surgery, but the problem with that is, is they're having to cut the pain medication back, because when you take pain medication, it eases the pain, but then she can't breathe. It, it, it eases the breathing. They don't want her breathing slow down. Because of the pneumonia and the treatments, they want her to breathe harder and stronger. So. They're cutting back her pain medication today, even though she's hurt. And now they got on the breathing treatments and, and they pat her on antibiotics the entire time. But we need to believe God she's healed. We need to believe God for full lung capacity. Pneumonia's gone and she's healed in Jesus' name. Yeah. Amen. So we want to pray now and agree in our <coughs> prayer. We can pray together. You guys be in agreement with me. Yeah. And she's up there in Marion I see you, so you can call up there. Uncle Charles is in the weight room or in the room all the time, or somebody's up there. But let's uh, check on them, pray for them. But let's be in agreement together as part of the, as a church because she's part of our family. Amen? Yes, amen? Let's pray. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We know what you said in the Word of God. If any two of us come together on earth is touching, whatever we agree on will be done. In your name, we know the Word says, by the stripes of Jesus, uh, we, would shout, we are healed. And we know if we set our faith, we thank you now that healing is a present possession. Father, I know personally as well as others, we've talked to Granny and she's not ready to leave this side. She said she's got more work to do and some things to accomplish, so we know where her faith is at. So we just hook up now with her based on the Word of God, and we speak now to this physical body. Her physical body, we command these lungs to function like they're created to, to function at, at top capacity in the name of Jesus. We command this pneumonia to cease to exist now, to go in Jesus' name. We thank you, Father, from where this surgery is taking place, for supernatural recovery, Father, from this procedure and this surgery. And right now, Father, from the top of her head to the bottom of her feet, we speak the healing power of God in the name of Jesus. We command every organ, every system to function just like you created it to. And we decree and declare as believers together, based on the word of God in Matthew 18, 19, that by the stripes of Jesus, she is healed and whole in Jesus' name. As it was said this morning, they said she just needs to turn a corner. She just needs to turn a corner because the doctor said there's not been one thing, there's been many. But there's not too many things for you to straighten out, Father, and we know that. So we just now apply our faith, and we thank you that she's turned the corner. We thank you that she's healed and that she's whole right now in the name of Jesus. It's done. And we lift them up now. Thank you for strength and comfort for the family, those that are there, and everybody involved. And we thank you, Father. She's coming up out and over, and what we have and what she has is more ammunition to witness for you, the Lord Jesus Christ, and more ammunition to defeat and destroy the kingdom of Satan by, because we know she's going to tell everybody she can about what you've done. Yeah. So she's going to go out and about, to and fro, just as she's been doing, and just tell them even more so than before about all you brought her through and the goodness of her Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you many lives are going to be changed. So what the devil's meant for bad 
as we set our faith and trust you, it's going to be turned for your goodness and your glory, just like it was with Lazarus and so many others. We count it done now in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this service. Thank you for the privilege and honor and opportunity to be here. Every person under the sound of my voice, we thank you now. We know you know every heart, every hurt, every need, every want, all the opposition in their life. We know that you know the word from your word they need this morning. So I just yield myself to be the vessel you've called me to be. A vessel that's meet, ready, and prepared for the master's use. And I thank you this morning that my tongue, the words of my mouth, will be as a pen of a ready writer. And the words that I speak will not be man's thoughts, plans, or ideas. But it's going to be your word delivered by the Holy Spirit. The anointing accompany the word. And we thank you the anointing breaks every yoke of bondage. This morning their minds are going to be renewed with the word of God. We're going to put on the mind of Christ. And we thank you right now. We're going to receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save our souls. And we know, as you said about the word, that we are set free as we receive that word. We shall know the truth, and the truth shall make us free. Whoever the Son has set free is free indeed, and we thank you that we're free indeed already. But we've got to renew our minds to that fact, to partake of that redemption that's already been given us, Father. That inheritance we already possess. So we thank you now. They're going to receive by faith. Their lives are going to be changed, challenged, and honored forever, never to be the same again. And we thank you for that. But most importantly, the last amen. <laughs> Your mighty name is going to be glorified, magnified, honored, and edified. And all that's said and done, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. God is good. And while I'm thinking about it, we got Mr. Paul back this morning. We're glad we got him back. Yes, amen. amen. It was a triple bypass, wasn't Mr. Paul? He said two and ended up being three. But regardless, we got him back. And we thank God. God's on the men. God's on the move. He's working on him. And now he's right back where he's supposed to be, and he's, he's still getting straightened out. And Miss Kelly's going to do part of that. So, <laughs> we'll pray for both of them, but we, we appreciate them and glad that, that he's back and she's back. But uh, j just for a second, here, look at Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verse 13. As I was praying this morning, I believe I'm going to go back to where we was at last week. But the Lord just impressed this upon my spirit to such a degree that I felt like that I was going to minister the whole way this morning along these lines. But, you know, we need to be careful uh, on the topic of spiritual warfare. And the reason for that is this. You can get caught, honestly, with a lot of books, tapes, CDs, and messages today, uh, you can think the devil is a lot bigger and better than he is. And you can think something's your problem that's not your problem. Amen? Amen? And you can say, well, Pastor, you teach us that Satan is our adversary. He's your adversary. That's true. The Bible says so. He's your enemy. He's your opponent. And that's true. And he's, he's seeking whom he may devour. We understand. That's what the Word says. But it also teach you that we've been given authority over all the power of the enemy. So, if the enemy is defeating me, I must ask myself, is the enemy really the problem, or is the problem that I'm not exercising my authority? See, very often I get deceived because I get to blame the devil for things that he's only got the authority and power that I give him. Right? Y'all understand that. The, the Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke 19, 13, the latter part there, he said, occupy till I come. You say, well, there's a battle at hand. Well, if you look up the words war and warfare, and those are the type of things in the New Testament there, they're never tied with the devil. They're always tied with you dealing with you. With you bringing your flesh into subjection. With you renewing your mind with the word of God. Because that's the access point that he has. You say, well, the devil's whipping me. The devil's already whipped, if the Bible's true. Jesus has de defeated the enemy for us. He is a defeated foe. He is under our feet. We're seated with Christ in heavenly places. He's already obtained an eternal inheritance for you and me. Now, it is a present possession. And I can't remember who said it. I think it was... Uh, Charles Cowan, Pastor Charles Cowan, in one of the Sunday morning sessions, or morning sessions, not Sunday, down at camp meeting one year, he said, we as Christians need to understand. We are not endeavoring to possess what Jesus has done for us. We are defending from a place of present possession. That might take a minute to sink in. But we are defending from a place of present possession. But our mentality is, even when we're walking by faith, is I'm endeavoring to achieve, I'm endeavoring to acquire, and it's going to be good one day, but the Bible says, now faith is. We could say faith 
is now. And the reason that very often we don't seem to get off our feet in our prayers and by faith is because we think faith is something way out yonder. When in essence, faith, the, I don't, what, faith begins where? Faith begins where the will of God is known. Very often I'm not sure, and I say I, I'm talking about us, we're not sure in our prayers and we're not sure, we're endeavoring to do, because faith begins where the will of God is known and the will of God is the word of God. You can't walk by faith to receive healing if you're not sure that God's promised you that. That's why it starts in the Word. But people go to wonder. We don't wonder and we don't wait. We go to the Word and we meditate and we pray. Right? Because we build the Word of God into our hearts, into our spirits. We renew our mind with the Word of God. Because if we're going to walk out God's plan, we got to change our way of thinking. And I don't know why the Lord impressed that so strongly upon me this morning. Be careful along those lines of studying spiritual warfare. Because if you want to get some messed up curriculum, that's one of the best topics to do it on. Because there's a lot of people that think everybody's got five, six, seven devils and that's what's wrong. And in essence, very often, the devil's got little or nothing to do with it. We've given him access point. And if we renew our mind with the word, bring this flesh into subjection, and yield to the spirit of God, we'll not have the problems we've had. You don't have to go to somebody else's house to mess with them. Amen? Does that make any sense to you? Yes, amen. Are you sure? Oh. We're defending from a place of present possession. I'm not defeated trying to become a success. That's wrong. As long as you think you're defeated, you're going to stay defeated. I've been given the victory through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, no matter how I feel this morning. Matter of fact, and then it come, on, come on over here in the service when I got in here. It's kind of a somber mood. But when I got in the office this morning, that's why I was praying. I said, Lord, I didn't feel like getting up. Lord, I don't feel like praying. Lord, I don't feel like studying. Lord, I don't feel like preaching this morning. Then I come in here and go out the same way. But when I was in the, when I was in the back back there, my next statement was, Lord, I can care less. I don't care how I feel. That's got nothing to do with the word being true. It's got nothing to do with my decisions. Because I'm not moved by how I feel. I'm not moved by my emotions. I'm not moved by other people's reactions. I'm moved by the word and the spirit. That's the only thing that's going to change my life. Thank you. Amen. Nothing else will change your life. So let's get back into the word. And then again, I think we'll get back on that later down the road. And again, the, the, the emphasis would be, be careful looking and searching and seeking and who you follow up behind about spiritual warfare. You get in big trouble. You'll end up with more problems than you had before you got started. Amen? And I don't know who that's for, but it won't cost you no extra. We won't charge you because we don't know who you are. Amen? But it, honestly, it'll all help everybody. But he said, occupy up till he comes. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. We started this last week, and I preached six months on this if I could. I'm sure that I won't. <clears throat> but it's something that's extremely necessary. And, and, and as, as again, the Lord impressed that other upon my heart when I first got here. I was questioned. I said, Lord, will I even you know, minister this today? But he said, no, nah, just say this, and then you get back on the other. So we are. We started last week, Ephesians 6, 18. We started and we said, the, the Lord said this. I told you, I was planning on preparing. I was planning on ministering. I was planning on preaching uh, what God said about 2017 this year. And the Lord said, I want you to do one better. Back up. He said, I want you to tell them how you got that answer. How you come to those conclusions. How you know those things. And, and then the title came this way. By the Spirit of God, pray to find God's way. You know, just because you're going away don't mean it's God's way. Right? You ever been away and you thought it was God's way and you get to the end of that path and realize it had been better if we consulted God. It had been better if we had talked to Him. There's a lot of people that have a lot of regret and regret is this. You look back and wish you had done something different so you wouldn't be dealing with what you're dealing with now. Now we just ask God to forgive us that we're sitting in the past because you can't go back and get that straightened out per se. But at the same time, the, the, the next best thing is go ahead. Go ahead today and let's start doing it God's way. Yes, amen. amen. We can't go back and straighten the past out, but you can do something about today. Amen. You can do something about tomorrow, next week, next month, and next year. So we're not living in the past, but we do want to renew our minds with the Word today. Find out how to do it God's way so we walk in the fullness of His blessings and all that He's got for us. So we're praying to find God's way, not just my way, not what everybody else is doing. You know, most people that know me know this is one of my pet peeves, and I'm really peculiar about it with my family because we're going to pray. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I don't care the pattern everybody follows. The pattern we follow is what the Spirit says. Those that are led by the Spirit, they're the sons of God. They're the daughters of God. Amen? Mm -hmm. I, every time before I pray almost every day, I hope my Bible would open the same place. John 16, 13. The Spirit is my God. Right? 
You say, well, they're doing this and they're doing the other. And then you hear this statement. Well, this is what everybody's doing. But very often, that's the reason you shouldn't do it. Yeah. Amen. Because this is what everybody's doing nine times out of ten. It's not right to begin with. Because you'll find when you start seeking God and following God, he'll, read, he'll lead you different than the crowd very often. Mm -hmm. Amen. You not do what everybody else does. But very often, as we've mentioned, uh, we just live day to day. Simply wake up today and do the same thing we did yesterday. Wake up, you know, eat, go to work, come home, go to sleep, repeat. Well, God, God might want to get in there somewhere. He might want to change some things, right? Amen. So this is what I've always done. That's not the reason to keep doing it. Let's seek God. This is going to be good. Amen. Amen. I can tell y'all excited this morning. I've got to heat up a degree more than usual, so y'all will get it's usually cooler in here than it is now. So if y'all think it's cold, y'all just got your mind wrong. I actually warmed it up a little bit this morning. I said, no, nah. I said, I know them. I'll be freezing. We'll get them in there. I'm going to take my jacket off and make it, but still. I love you that much. Ephesians 6, 18. Y'all there. It says this. The first two words. Praying how often? Always. You think prayer should be a part of your life? Yes. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, just reviewing through these, we said it last week, it says pray without ceasing. You look up different translations, you'll understand you're to pray continually. You are to be cultivating and developing a life of prayer. Colossians 4, 2 says continue in prayer and watching the same with thanksgiving. And the New Living Translation of uh, Colossians 4, 2 says devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. <clears throat> if we're going to hear from God, we've got to cultivate and develop our prayer lives. Yes. Just as God must be sought out to be found, the will of God must be prayed out to be revealed. It's been several years back now, but we was at an AFI meeting with Brother Andy, and he made this statement. It made perfectly good sense to me, not that it had to, as long as it's the Spirit of God. But he made this statement. He said, this is the situation that the church has come into. And he wasn't talking about mine or yours. He was talking about, in general, what the Spirit of God told him. He said, the church has got to this place where there's now a, a spiritual deficit of direction and instruction. And he said, this is what the Holy Ghost told me. He said, we, for a long time, we lived off of the prayers of the old saints. Because the old men and women of God and the ministers back then, they knew of to live a life that was consecrated, dedicated, and to seek God. And they prayed us up for a period of time. And he said, we enjoyed that. He said, but it's come to a time. This has been a few years ago. He said, it's come to a time when we got to pray. We got to seek God. Not that we shouldn't have done it all the time. He said, we got to pray and we got to seek God and we got to know what's God saying to us. And he's talking to ministers. What's God saying to your church? You know, if the minister hadn't prayed and saw God's face and didn't know which way he's going, the church is in trouble. Yeah. I've had ministers of the gospel to tell me, I don't have time to pray and study like you do. I don't have time to do that. Preachers that pastor people Sometimes hundreds of people don't have time to pray. I know their messages are awesome. I love them, but they'd have to pay me to listen to them. I wouldn't even buy them. If you don't pray before you preach, you might as well. You just don't need to be, you, you don't need to be, you got to hear from heaven, amen? How do we know what to do if we haven't heard from God? Right? So just as God must be sought out to be found, the will of God must be prayed out. To be revealed. We must stop saying we don't know what to do and start praying so we'll know what to do. Right? Yes, amen. Now the secret, the answers that I'm talking about right now do not come through social media. They don't always come through your family. They don't come through Facebook. They don't come through other people. It comes from God to you. You, if you are a Christian, you can hear God for your life. You can. Old time religion teaches us and has taught many the, the, see, the secret to, to I, I, not, I wouldn't say no to God, but what you have to do, I would say, is you need a star on the board because you're at church. You need to go to church, get your star for Sunday school, and give your tithes and you're going to hell. That's what religion teaches you. Works unto salvation. We don't work to get saved. We work because we are saved. Thank God for His mercy. Thank God for His grace. Yes, amen. We want to teach you that you can know God. We want to teach you to where you got questions. God's got the answers. It's going to come through the Word. It's going to come by His Spirit. No matter what it is today that you're asking, that you have need of, God has the answer. He knows all things. Yes. Do you agree with the Word? Psalms 127.1, we say it all the time, <clears throat> says, unless the Lord builds a house, 
The work of the builders is wasted. Lest the Lord protects the city, guarding it with centuries will do no good. Now that's the New Living Translation. You miss out on God's best by not praying out God's plan for your life. And I know he won't mind me doing so. But I'm going to use Jay again. He loves when I use him in front of the church. Right, Jay? Huh? He just grinning again. But you miss out on God's best by not praying it out in your life. He graduated high school just a little while back. Uh, most people know some things about Jay. He was enrolled in tech over here. He said, are you against tech? People ask me these kind of things. And the answer is always no. You against tech? You against college? You against higher education? No. My problem is this. People just follow a pattern. They just do what everybody else does. That's wrong. I say that Adam, you don't do what everybody else does. You follow God's plan. He might want you to do something different. But we don't even consider it. We got to give him a place. Jay was enrolled in tech. Everyone's encouraging him. This is what you need to do. Now, everything's moving forward. And I can say this as his father and as his pastor. I was plumb sick the whole time. Inside. Never said a word to begin with. I was plumb sick. Things just moving along. Things proceeding. It's coming time to start. And I was just about nauseated spiritually. Because the Lord told me some things a while back, but then even then, I knew things wasn't right. It wasn't sitting with me right in the spirit. And of course, Jake could tell you, I didn't tell him you got to do this, that, or the other. He's involved the whole time. He's coming to me and asking me different questions, saying, Daddy, you know this, don't you? You know this, and you know that. And I said, Son, let's make a deal. Let's pray about it. And God will reveal what we need to do. God will reveal how we need to handle things. But, I, I, but what we're doing, we're praying. What I tell Jake to do, let's pray. Let's pray. God's got the answer. God knows how to straighten things out. God knows how to handle things. And the day's coming closer and closer. And I was in my office, and this is how things work. This is how it work for you. You say, well, I'm, I'm not so sure. You're not, you're not, you're not right about Jay. Well, you don't have to be, because I'm known as his dad. Amen? And you don't have to be because you're not Jay. That's another problem we got. We're so, we're so consumed with everybody else, we don't have time to pray for our own lives. Then we look like a mess, because we haven't been looking in the mirror of the Word for ourselves. Amen? A lot of times people don't want the best for you, but they don't know what they're talking about. Because they don't know what the best is for your life, because it's not even their responsibility to pray it out. They don't know what they're talking about. Amen? But a lot of people tell me you should do this, that, and the other. Well-meaning people that love me and said it with the best of intentions and had no ill will whatsoever. People that love me and God told me to do something exactly opposite of what they said. Exactly the opposite. Now they meant well, but they hadn't prayed out the will and plan of God for my life. God knows what's best for my life. Amen. You're here this morning as a result of prayer. We saw God. This is what he said to do. Things wasn't going right. Things was clogged up, if you want to call it that. We was pastoring down there at Bono and TAP, looking for other people to start a church. We knew he was going to start a church, and I forgot about Jay. I still got him on another book here. I knew he was going to start a church, going to start, start a ministry. Things were clogged up. You ever felt like things were clogged up in your life? Yeah. Everybody has, if they tell the truth. Things clogged up. Things wasn't going right. You just know things aren't right. Dr. Hagen used to make, he made this statement several times. He said, you get to this place, he said, it feels like you're washing your feet with your socks on. He said, it just ain't right. He said, you just ain't right. Something ain't right. What do you do? You pray. I was praying and said, God, what should we do? I see this vision. I know this is what you want to do. I know you want to start another church and churches down the road. And I know, and he said, this is your problem. He said, and what did he answer me? When I asked him. When I talked to him. You know, God will talk to you. God will speak to you. But you can't be too busy. <coughs> I said, you can't be too busy. You can't be too caught up with everything else. Holy Spirit's a perfect gentleman. We talked something about this last week, I believe. He's a perfect gentleman. And I said, if there's a problem with the Holy Spirit, that's it. There isn't a problem with him. But if there's a problem with him, then that be the problem. Is if you don't ask, he's not going to oblige. He don't force you to do anything. He'll impress some things upon your heart, upon your spirit. But if you just keep ignoring it, it's just like sin. The more you do it, your conscience gets seared. And the more you ignore it, the easier it is to ignore it. Amen? The Spirit of the Lord in your life can get louder or can get quieter. You can be drowned out with everything else. Get so muffled that you can't hardly hear God. You don't know what to do. A Christian, saved, Spirit-filled, can very often not have any idea what to do whatsoever. Because very often they get too many things going on. Amen? Yes. Amen. Activity is not necessarily productivity. But the Lord told me about the church. He said, your problem is this. He said, you know what I've called you to do, but you're going about it the wrong way. He said, you're looking for other people to do what I've called you to do. So we prayed, sought God. Now we're here. You're here. I just was reading, actually, with Miss Vicky. Is she in here? Yeah, she's in here. I was reading Miss Vicky's letter earlier, previously here, and, and she wrote. And I said, well, it's, it's getting in. He said, Miss Vicky arrived? No, but her mind's been renewed with the word of God. I haven't arrived either, Miss Vicky, so we're in the same <laughs> But, but I'm just saying that. I'd say that about anybody, not just Miss Vicky. 
she give me no reason to say she hadn't arrived. I just know she's a human like me, so she hadn't arrived. We're still working on it. But she was talking about tithing and talking about giving and talking about she got to a place where there's, you know, in the natural, it'd be foolish because she didn't have enough money to get by and God's saying give. God's saying give. And when it'd be easier to not tithe, and God, you know, we've been teaching here in the Word, and she said, I tithe. And then she's talking about how God did this thing six times over what she even sowed to begin with once she stepped out and obeyed God. But she learned that at this church. You say, can somebody else have taught her that? Yeah, of course. But she's destined or ordained to be here. I'm not the only person that teaches this message, and I don't think I am. But everything is set in motion, even what you see in everything we do. Somebody had to pray to find out what to do. Somebody had to say, God, what would you, people would say about this church and us coming here, what in the world we need another church for? And I would say to myself, because I don't try to be as smart as that, but I'd say to myself, why don't you talk to God about that? Because I don't know why we need one here either. That's what I would say. But God knows best. And if you go with the popular opinion, you'll never follow God. And you won't ever know God. Don't go taking a poll about what you should do. Because you'll get further away from God's plan. Don't sit down at the dinner table, even today, and weighing out what you should do. This is for somebody. You seek everybody's opinion. You need to be a God pleaser, not a people pleaser. There's a balance. There's people that God will put in your life to help you. I understand that. I'm not telling you not to listen to nobody. But when you've got a decision to make, it's not always best the more people you've got that's got input. You'd be more confused than you was before. Those that are led by the Spirit of God, not popular opinion. They're the sons of God. They're the daughters of God. Jay was, I was back to Jay. Jay thought I left him out. He was almost yeah. to get him. I didn't leave him out. But back to Jay. And I wrote all this down. And I was in my office one day. And I was praying. Exactly. I wrote this down. And the Holy Spirit said, understand. Jay will not miss my plan and go to hell if he goes to tech. But it's simply not what I've called him to do. And it's not my best. I've called him to go another way. And if he goes to tech, he'll still have to come back. This is what the Lord showed me when I was sitting in my office. I lift my hands up. He said, he can go this way, but you need to understand. I've called him to go this way. And if he goes this way, he's going to have to come back. So it's not that he's going to die and go to hell by any means, but it's going to be harder. Do you know we make our way harder a lot of times? Because we do and don't pray. Instead of praying, then do. Yes, amen. Amen. We make a mess out of it. He said, I've called him to go another way. And if he goes to tech, he's still going to have to come back. To my plan, so it would be much easier and much wiser if he were to start now. This is what the Holy Spirit said. He said, I've called Jay into ministry, so training in ministry is much more important than training in any other area. So we obeyed, and we got that straight. Well, I've been telling Jay for a while now. This came about this past week. You don't just pray one time either. You keep praying. You keep praying. Amen? People's got a mess because they're not praying. They're not seeking God. God will get you straightened out. He'll help you. You don't have to have a mess of a life. People will say it except this is just life. I reject that. The Holy Spirit will make you look like a genius, not a failure when he gets involved. That's not accurate. Don't say that kind of stuff. People even around here say it all the time. This is just life. It is not. True life is not a wreck. It's not. Even if you've been messed up, yes, thank God for the redemption power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he will forgive you no matter how much you sin, how much of a mess that you made, but you can't accept that your life is supposed to be a mess and walk in God's best. He'll take your mess when you trust Him with it and turn it into a masterpiece. It is not supposed to be a mess. You're not supposed to be a mess. People say, oh, this is just how everybody is. It is not how everybody is. And just because it's the way most people are doesn't mean that it's the way you should be. Amen? Amen? If we get into the Word, we'd be in tune with the Spirit more, and we're talking about praying. We'd be in tune with the Spirit, and we'd avoid 95% of the issues and the problems and messes that we get into this day. But I had made this statement, and I talked to him about it this week. I made this statement, Jay, you need to understand, you know, you need to be doing this, that, and the other, and there's other things he's doing working-wise and that kind of stuff. But ministry is a few, several years off. It's not right now. And I told him that. And the Lord corrected me. He said, you're right that ministry, full-time ministry, and him working yeah. in the church and stuff is a few years off. He said, but ministry starts training now. He said, the fullness of his ministry is several years off. He said, but to start is now. He said, how is he ever going to walk in the fullness if you don't start training him today? And the Lord corrected me. He said, start training him now. So we're training him now. But back here in the back, I see many pieces that's put together. 
at the other church down there for a while. Jeremy, Pastor Jeremy, where did he? He's a, he was the pastor. Then he's over all the communications. Well, there was some different times. I remember when I was in there. We're starting LCU on tomorrow night. And he's the campus director of LCU. And I look back to different times of praying and seeking God, and it's God that's putting everything together. Thank you, Lord. And a lot of times people say, well, you know, maybe you thought this up and you thought that up. I'm not that smart. But I do know how to pray and seek God, and, and, and then I see. you got you got all these scattered pieces that's everywhere. And then you start asking God for help, and as you listen, it's, it all comes together. And, and people say, well, how did, how did all this come together? It even amazes me. And we're just getting started. We're just getting started. But we got to get God involved in the process of what we call our life. If we keep doing the same things, we're going to keep getting the same results. And why, if you got God who loves you and is for you on your best day and your worst day, who has the answer to every problem you have, who has, who has the direction and the wisdom every time you lack it, why not use him? Why not depend upon him? He's got the answer. Amen? He said, if any of you lack wisdom, ask for it, and he'd give it to you. Right? Amen. Liberally and freely. Amen. God will put everything together in your life if we're only seeking and asking for wisdom and direction. This is the roadblock. Go to Psalms 46, verse 10, that many people run into. Is this past week? You know, sitting down there with Pastor Russell and Bono, and, you know, oh, I love him. He's a great guy. Regardless, but I'm not talking about the kind of guy he is. But we're sitting there talking about the church, you know, meeting and going through some of the same things, and <clears throat> you know, talking about the men's fellowship and the ladies' fellowship. And he's telling me about this and telling me about that, and I'm telling him, you know, what I think and this kind of stuff. And and we got down to the end of it, and I said, you know, Russ, I'm just going to be straight with you. And I said, I want to make sure that you understand this. I said, because I understand it, and we both need to understand it. You can think what you think, and I can think what I think, but God knows. God knows. And no matter what I do to endeavor, you know, you, I could try, he could try, everybody could try just as hard as they could to make even that church grow and succeed. God's got the answer. He's the one that's got the answer. And so I can tell him, I said, there's nothing that's going to replace you coming out here when nobody's here. You having the questions about what to do, you get in prayer, you get in the spirit, and you ask the one that knows, and he'll tell you how to put it together. I'll be here to help you any way that I can, but I can't be God because I make a, a bad one. Amen? I don't, I don't quite measure up to God. We endeavor to be more like Him every day, but I haven't arrived yet. And I can assure you that I don't know everything. Uh, it's very minuscule compared to what God knows. What does He know? Everything. Good, good scripture here. Psalms 46 verse 10 says this. Psalms 46 verse 10. Be still. Say, so why are you reading this? Number one, the Holy Spirit says so. But in this society today, there is a revelation that we need. Jesus had to get alone. Jesus, who had the spirit without measure, had to be quiet. He had to pray and seek Heavenly Father for advice. He had to have times to power back up in the spirit. Because although he was Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, he stripped himself of his divinity and deity and became a man and walked this earth anointed of the Holy Spirit like you and me. He had to get away. If Jesus had to get away and pray, do you think you and I will? Have to. Okay. Without question. We're not going to make it any other way. Amen? But he said, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted on the earth. But he said, be still and know that I am God. Now I want to read you something real quick. If y'all let me. You will. Y'all let y'all run out. This is an I believe in vision. Just listen to it. <clears throat> Dr. Kenneth E. Hagin wrote this, and, and this is Jesus speaking, said, I have come to answer your prayer. This is what he said. It was nearly five years later in 1957 when the Lord appeared to me again in my fourth vision of him. My wife and I had just returned to our home in Garland, Texas, after spending 16 months in meetings in California. We then held a meeting for our home full gospel church in Garland. It was during the third week of this meeting that I had another supernatural visitation from the Lord. At the close of my message one night, a spirit of prayer descended upon the congregation, and we all gathered around the altar to pray. We prayed for quite some time. After a while, I got off my knees and sat on the steps to the platform. I was sitting there with my eyes open, singing in other tongues as the spirit gave utterance. 
when suddenly I saw Jesus standing about three feet in front of me. He said, I have come to answer your prayer. I knew exactly what he was talking about. I had been praying for some time for my wife, who had a goiter. That's a tumor, right? You know this? A growth. Yeah, I don't use the word, but still. He was, had a goiter. Let me find my place. It was growing larger and larger until now she was having choking spells. From the time we were first married, I had sensed in my spirit that Aretha, that's his wife's name, would die at an early age. And I thought that perhaps this time was approaching. I prayed the rest of the night about this and said to the Lord, I have obeyed you. And But did you get that part? Do you know what he said? He said, I prayed the, I've been praying and I prayed the rest of the night about this. He had a life of prayer. Sometimes people think it's just for this minister or that minister or this special person that can know God. That's not true. It's for every Christian. It's for every believer. The Holy Spirit's not available for one or two. He's for everyone that believes. Amen? We can be filled with the Holy Spirit and power and, be, and know God even on a different dimension. Right? I prayed the rest of the night about this and said to the Lord, I have obeyed you and have done your will. I have left my church and my family and have been an evangelistic field for many years. My wife has stayed at home and has been faithful to raise our children. I am still a young man at that time. I was in my 30s. And we have been married for many years. Please let me keep my wife. In the vision, the Lord said to me, I have come to answer that prayer. Tell your wife to be operated on, for she will live and not die. Although I didn't mention it to my wife, I had felt all along that if she were operated on, she would die. She later told me that she had known for several years that she would die when she was operated on for this goiter. But the Lord said to me, she will live and not die. According to the natural course of events, listen to this. According to the natural course of events, without divine intervention, she would die. But I have heard your prayers and have come to answer them. She shall live. Listen to this. Then Jesus said something that absolutely melted me. And I've never been able to forget it. It blessed me. And it helped me then, and it still blesses me now. This is what Jesus said to him as an answer to his prayer. He said, I did this, son, just because you asked me to. You don't know how I long to do for my children if they would only ask me and believe me. And I cannot answer their prayers unless they have faith because I cannot violate my word. But how often I long to help them, if only they would let me, by taking me at my word and bringing me their problems, trusting me to undertake them. Again, he said, tell your wife to be operated on, for she will live and not die. With those words, he disappeared. Even though the doctors were greatly concerned about my wife's condition, Aretha and I had great joy through it all because we knew the outcome in advance. You don't have to have a spirit of fear when you've got a spirit of faith about what's going on in your life or even what's to come. You can know ahead of time. But we don't know very often because we've not took the time to pray and seek God and find out from the one that knows. Amen? He said, ask and you shall receive. So is the receiving tied to the asking. He said, seek and you shall find. So is the finding got anything to do with the seeking? He said, knock and it shall be open. So does it being open have anything to do with whether we knock or not? Yes. He said, the thirsty and the hungry would be filled. Pastor Jeremy brought up earlier, was it James 4, 8? Draw out to God and he'll draw out to you. One of my pastor friends, or somebody that's actually over me in authority, friend as well, but he makes this statement. He said, when you get serious with God, he'll get serious with you. Amen? He said, when you get serious with God, he'll get serious with you. And, and again, we're going to teach you more, but you have people say, well, I, just don't, I just don't know how to pray. Well, there are things and guidelines in the Word to help you pray effectively. I'm not going to tell you there's not. But also, we'll tell you this in balance. 
There are certain things, for instance, it'll not hit the ceiling if you don't pray to the Father in the name of Jesus. That's a necessity. That's not an option. Right? People say all religions pray if they don't pray in the name of Jesus. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. And our God's not dead. He's alive. So it matters. He's our access. Right? He's the way. He's the door. He's the vine. So we go to the Father in the name of Jesus. There are some rules that are necessary for you to know, but many of you already know those things. Amen? But then you've got to take that time to pray. You have a question. I was telling Pastor Russell this week, if you've got a question, write it down on your legal pad. If that's the only thing in there, and you take your Bible, and you go in your office, or you go over and you pray, and don't come out until you've got the answer. Now people will say, well, i got, I, I got too much going on. That's right. But when you get to the place where you have to have that answer, and it could be a life or death situation, some of that stuff that's going on, you cut it out. When it gets serious enough, I've said before about praying, there's two times, two types that I talk about. There's nine or ten, twelve different ways to pray, different kinds of prayer. But at the same time, there's two different times that you pray. It's when you want to, and it's a good thing to do it then. Not just when you want to, but it's a good time to pray all the time. But it's also those times when you have to that you better get an answer or you're in trouble. Amen? But if we would cultivate and develop a life of prayer and a relationship with God, we could avoid a lot of those situations. I'll just be honest with you. Even right now, I don't, I'm not, uh, you know, I am confessing and professing, but from the beginning till the end with Granny at the hospital up there, I've had another victory from the beginning. I do not believe she's going anywhere. From the very beginning. I pray the same prayer every time you say, Pastor, do you know everything? I do not. I do not know everything. He said, what would you do if she had took a turn for the worst? When we left her, I keep going. Amen. I don't know everything. But from the first time I walked in, all the way to now, I'm not going to worry one second. And I know some people can say, well, you just don't care. I don't have a reason to care in that sense because I'm not worried about it. I'm not worried. I heard what she said, and if what she says is true, and what she wills is true, now she just said, I'm ready to check out of here. She had enough going on to go ahead and leave. She did, for sure. But that ain't what she said. I heard what she said in all two years. She said, I've got some people I need to take with me that I haven't took with me yet. She said, I know these things. I know what God wants to do. And I know that I'm not through. So what are we going to do? We're going to stand on the Word. We know God's Word is true. Now, you really got to seek God when you get in those situations and the individual can't talk and you don't know their will because their will matters. You have authority in your life. You do. We walk in sometimes and pray with people. When my daddy left here, a lot of people did not understand. Did not understand. I did not understand. The family, for the most part, I can't speak for everybody, did not understand how a man that preached and taught faith his entire life, that preached and taught divine health and healing his entire life, could die at 49 years old of what he died at. He said, you condemn him? No. But he knew what the word said a hundred times over, probably more than I did, and most of the people around. Probably if you put us all together, he knew it that much. Just to be honest with you. He could spit it out like a machine gun. And in numerous different areas in his life, you know, he walked it out. But then he got to a point, and it was just like he just give up. He said, how do you know? I was there. What was other people was there? It's just like daddy just give up. Man of faith. And people would say, in the church. Well, if it don't work for Pastor Danny, I know it ain't going to work for me. If it don't work for Pastor Danny, we might as well all quit. No, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But Pastor Danny, even if you have the word, you got to do the word. And the decisions you make are the ones that's going to determine your destiny and the outcome in your life. If you're miserable today, you need to examine what you've been doing. If you're not succeeding today, you need to examine what you've been doing. You say, well, I'm just going through a hard time and I'm in faith. If that is true, that is fine. That's fine. But I'll tell you this, the Holy Spirit's a reviewer. And things get not going good in my life. I say, Lord, show me. Just reveal it, Holy Spirit. Anything and everything, I'm not getting out of faith, but anything and everything that I'm doing that's hindering me from walking out your plan, show it to me. And if he shows it, we get it straight. If not, we just keep walking by faith. But Brother Randy Greer came in when Daddy was on his deathbed down there. Everybody's praying, all is believing God. Brother Andy made this statement. He says, you know, if there is an ounce of faith in there, he said, if there is an ounce, excuse me, of doubt and unbelief in there, he said, I don't know anything about it. Because you guys were praying and believing God, and we wouldn't accept anything different. And he said, I knew not to say anything contrary, because y'all probably would have stoned us. You know, if you said anything opposite of he's coming up out here. We would believe in God, and we thought that is believing God. But Brother Andy, and this is what you have to do sometimes. 
People say, well, you know, he didn't care. He should have stayed. Well, he didn't leave the, the area, but he left and went to his hotel room because he knew something was wrong when he was in the room. And he said, I got to get away and I got to pray. Something's not right. He didn't tell us that. He told us after the fact. But he said, I went to, he said, I went to my motel room and began to pray and seek God. He said, what? You, do you see the common theme no matter the story that I tell? You see, there's one common theme we're talking about. Praying to find God's way. You'd be confused and discouraged and defeated and not know what to do when you don't get God involved in your life. Not just your problems, but in your life. You can avoid a lot of problems if you get him involved. We can't have time for Facebook, Twitter, social media, and everything else, and we can't read our Bibles and we can't pray. You'll be frustrated all the time. And you'd cause other people to be frustrated. Amen? You'd be a source of frustration. We don't want to do that. we got to get in the Word. we got to spend time with God. Amen? Yes, amen. amen. <coughs> Brother Andy's praying about Daddy, praying about the situation, and the Holy Spirit spoke to him. Now, none of us knew this at the time, so nobody told him. None of us. Mom might have known, but we didn't. He said, unless you can get, this is what the Holy Spirit said to Brother Randy while Daddy was laying in the hospital bed. We're believing God for his healing. See, things happen all the time. There is an answer, even though you might not know the answer. Right? There's an answer. And we had to say, well, I got so-and-so, and they did this, and this, and that, and the other, and then they died early, and all this happened. Well, that don't mean God failed them. And just because you don't know why things happen doesn't mean there's not a reason. And it's not necessarily that they did thus and so wrong. They might have been ready to go. They might not have wanted to live any longer. They may not have stepped out in faith with whatever they were facing. We're not attacking nobody. It does not mean they're in hell. They're very well in heaven. They're a Christian. Amen? Yes, they're in heaven. Right? The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit told Brother Andy in the room. He said, this is what's wrong. He said, unless you can get Pastor Danny, who was our daddy, unless you can get him away and get him to change his mind, he's going to die and there's nothing nobody can do about it. And he's got, he, he actually wrote some things in a book about it. But it's about divine destiny. He said he decided that he was not going to fight, that he was not going to, he's facing numerous things in his life at that time, he said that he was not going to face what he was facing, that he was going to check out and leave out of here. He said he made that decision before he, he was unconscious at the time, he said before he got unconscious, he made that decision, and no matter how much you pray or anybody else prays, he's going to die. He's coming to be home with me, 49 years old. You say, how did Brother Andy know that? Because God knows. Mm -hmm. And when he got in contact with God, God revealed it by the Spirit of God. And some people say, well, there's gifts and all kinds of things. I'm not teaching at that level right now. You have to understand that. I know that. I understand that. But it's still a truth that everybody hears true God. And it's still a truth as far as it pertains to your life. Maybe not on the grand scale of everything, because none of us know everything. But different offices know more about the whole than some. But as far as it pertains to your life, you can hear God. That is scriptural. But he said, unless you get Pastor Danny awake and get him to change his mind, he's going to die and come to be with me. So Brother Andy, just, he was there. We thank God. But he just kind of walked around. He was just present. Because he knew something that we didn't know. And we were not willing to receive it. If he had said that, he's true. We probably would have asked him to stay outside. Because all we knew is what Daddy said. You know, before he got unconscious, he told us, we believe in God. He didn't want to let us down, so he said, let's keep believing. <clears throat> so we believe that he's ready to die. So what happened? He died. Why? Because he set his will in motion. Mm -hmm. That's what he decided to do. And people say, oh, whatever God wants, whatever God wants. Every time you say that, you open the door for the devil. You need to know what God wants. Not, don't just go to <coughs> Mary and say whatever God wants. We pray and seek. This is God's will, primarily, right? But specifically for your life, you pray in line with this to find out the specific will, plan, and purpose. It matters who you marry. It matters where you work. It matters who you fellowship with. It matters who you witness to. Every, it matters how you handle your money. It matters where you sow your seed. All of those things matter, and the Spirit of God will reveal it to you if you see His face. All of them matter. But there's a great common mentality of nothing matters. What's going to happen is going to happen anyways. That is not the way. That you're supposed to direct your life. We're supposed to direct our life under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Did you hear what Kenneth E. Hagin said? He said this. Jesus said to him. He didn't say it. He said, I did this, son, just because you asked me to. You don't know how long, how I long to do for my children if they would only ask me and believe me. Many times they beg and cry and pray, but they don't believe. And I cannot answer their prayers unless they have faith. Where does it come from? <clears throat> the word. 
because they cannot violate my word. But how often I long to help them if only they would let me by taking me at my word and bringing me their problems and trusting me to undertake for them. Amen? Now people say whatever God wills, that's what he's going to do. That's not how it works. You've got to say in the matter. <coughs> You've got to say in the matter. If the devil's at the house, you've got to do something about it. Amen? You do. You're the one that's got to exercise authority at your house. There's people that have all kinds of things, and we've had people, you know, I, I'm not knocking nobody, I don't know any better, but last this who come to the house, you know, they go and get married and this kind of stuff, so they come on over, we want you to bless the house. The house ain't no more blessed than the people that live in it. The house don't mean nothing. It's brick, wood, and mortar, and clay. You say, what do you do? I just go over and say a prayer and go home. <laughs> At the most. That ain't got to be, I, I, you know, so well. So I, we've had numerous people who say, well, you know, I know we're going to make it because of who married us. Well, me and Arlene have like a good track record, so you might not get us married. <laughs> You're not going to make it or not make it because of who marries you. You're going to make it or not make it because of what you do after you get married. That's what's going to determine whether you're going to make it or not. Amen? The same way with your children. <clears throat> yes, go to Matthew chapter 7. We mentioned this, but I want you to see it in your Bible. God wants to put us over, not under. He's made a way through Jesus. He's written this thing out here in the Word. This is the handbook for Christian living. This is the will, plan, and purpose. We got an inheritance today, and we're defending from a place of possession. Right? We're not endeavoring to acquire it. I understand if you focus only on the natural. You say, well, I don't have this, that, or the other. Well, I understand what you're saying is it's not manifesting your life now, but it can't be your focus that it's not manifesting your life. Your focus, you're abiding in the Word. You're not abiding in what you have or don't have. Amen? I don't walk outside on the good days, and mostly nobody knows that I do this anyways, but I've got a habit. I've had it for a long time. I walk in here, and this one ain't nobody here for me, but I walk in here, and I get up behind the pulpit. And I pray for you guys, and I say, I thank you, Father. This church is thriving, flourishing, and growing in every way, shape, form, or fashion. And then we got a, I got a prayer that I say after. I don't ever say that when I pray for them. But I say it all the time. I go outside sometimes. And when I get to my truck, I stop and turn around. And most people know I don't stop and turn around unless I'm serious about something. Because when I get on a motion to go, I'm gone. And I stop and turn around and say the same thing, say it out in the parking lot. Because you've got to believe it if you're ever going to receive it. Amen. God didn't send us there to fail. He sent us there to put us over. Hallelujah. He sent us there to succeed. That's what we do. Amen. Amen. You have pastors who talk defeat and failure all the time. You say, how do you get the church straightened up? Well, you're going to have to get rid of him or get his mind changed. Amen. Because it won't ever work. We can't speak defeat and failure and have success. we got to pray and seek God. You say, well, there's a problem. God knows what the problem is. We pray and seek God, find out what it is, apply the word of God, and we're going to overcome no matter the problem. Amen. You go to the hospital, not just to visit granny, but anybody. You go in with one mentality. Now, the Spirit of God will lead you different. There's times people are ready to go. You don't pray for them to be healed because you'll be, uh, it, it'll affect your faith. You don't need to do that. Amen. There are different times somebody's up in age and they decide, I'm tired and I'm ready to go. Peaceful transition is what you pray. Because it's up to them. You don't decide that. Amen. Amen. Brother Mike's father just wanted to be with the Lord. Just a little bit ago. He's ready to go. They knew he was ready to go. They didn't never say it in a bad way whatsoever. Understood completely what they said, but it had been fine with them if he'd have went a few more days than he did. But he was all bullheaded, and not, you know, Brother Mike, he'd never done like that. So. <laughs> I'm just joking. But it took him a few days to check out of here. But he knows where he's at now, right? We didn't go in there and believe God to raise him up off the deathbed. If there was things that intervened there by the Spirit and God was to intervene, that's fine. But we prayed right in line with them and, and they told us what to pray. And, and we went to his funeral, but we knew he wasn't there. Because they knew God's will. He's on the other side. Amen. But every time I go to, and the granny, I mean, granny's the sickest by, by the stripes of Jesus, she's healed. That's all that comes up every time. I don't have anything. Else. That's what we pray. Now we pray specific about, you know, like they tell us about the lungs and that kind of stuff. We address them specifically. But then at the end of the prayer, we just thank you, Father, by the stripes of Jesus, she's healed. Every old sister comes just like you created to. In the name of Jesus, we speak to it, command it to, right? And we know she's in agreement with us. Yes. Amen? Yes. So we know where she's going. When she leaves here, we just ain't ready for her to go now. Right? Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. But that basis is where? Faith begins where the will of God is known. The will of God is the <clears throat> word of God. Yes. James, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, Jesus said this. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Not, now listen. You're seeking God, not everybody else. 
The Bible does not say you shall know man's opinion. It'll set you free. I'll tell you a secret. It'll put you in more bondage than you've ever been in. You love people, but you trust God primarily. God is your answer. Jesus is your answer. Amen? Talking to somebody the other day about, you know, drugs and all kind of stuff people's been on and, and hung on all kind of stuff. They, they, you can't help them play no church games with them. That don't set them free. Jesus sets them free. It's a person, not a thing, not a program, and not a process. You shall know the truth. His name is Jesus. And he shall set you free. You come in contact with the one that brings freedom. That's the only freedom. And a lot of times you say, I don't want to set them in this program and that program. And they come out and make it two weeks and they go back as bad as ever before. Because they got to meet somebody. Not go through a process. You say, how many steps do you believe in? One. You say, oh, there's a lot more steps than that. Well, there's probably thousands even in the spirit. But that's the one you start with. Or nothing else goes right. That one step is I can't do it, but I know who can, and I'm going to trust him. Yes, I might not know everything that means, how all that works out, and everything he's going to lead me to do, but I know my way hadn't worked. Yeah. I know the world's way hadn't worked. Mm -hmm. I want to trust Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to try him. I'm going to trust him. Mm -hmm. Amen? Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be open. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open. Matthew 21, verse 22. I'm going to give you a few scriptures. Say, what's the purpose of these scriptures? It'll build your faith. You need to know them. You pray and believe in God for something? Don't pray until you read these scriptures. Until you meditate on them. Amen? Amen. Dr. Hagen said, unless it was an immediate a necessity that I had to pray right now. You know, a lot of people just go to spitting and praying and all that good stuff and that never changes. Why? Because it's the prayer of faith. Prayer of faith that saves the sick. It's not a multitude of words. It's not if you can pray more eloquent than somebody else. He said, unless I absolutely have to pray right now about anything, this is what I do. I find out the words from the Word of God. I find out the Word of God that promised me what I'm believing for and I'll meditate on it for three or four days. He said in the last 30, 40 years at that time, however long it was, he said, I've never prayed a prayer that hadn't been answered. Now, most people would not be able to say that. He said, but I don't pray like most people do. He said, I can just go to pray. He said, I find the scriptures in the Bible that promise me what I'm looking for. He said, I meditate on them over and over and over again, sometimes as much as three or four days at a time, get them built into my spirit, even if I know them at a time, get them built into my spirit, and then when I pray, I pray in faith, and I get results every time. Amen? Yes. How many times you've got people say, well, you know, you say, well, I, I want you to pray right now. And they say, no, let's meditate on the Word. Mm -hmm. Let's get the Word built in first. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the things we do are not effective because they're not in line with the Word. You say, should we pray? Yes. But we need to pray based on the Word of God. Right? So he said in Matthew 21, 22, all this is good. But he said, all things, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer. Believing you shall receive. I'm going to receive what I ask for and what I believe for, right? Mark 11, 24. You write down 20, 22 through 24. But Mark 11, 24 says, Therefore I say unto you, What things soever you desire. This is a far cry from what many say, Whatever God wants me to have, I'm just going to have it. That's not in the Bible. I said, That is not in the Bible. He said, What things soever you desire when you pray. When you pray, if you got a need, if you got a want, if you got a hurt, if you got a desire, you got to pray. What things ever you desire when you pray, not if you pray, not if you have time in your schedule. Believe that you receive them. How are you going to believe that you receive them? You say, I'm just going to believe. Faith begins where the will of God is known. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing what? The Word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Look at John 14. You can take these with you when you go to the house. I'm not going to finish anyway, so we find them. Either way. John 14. I, I pray that you got something. Amen. A lot of times people say, well, I want to listen. You know, it's not going to hurt you to listen to people pray. But one of the ways that I learned how to pray is being an employee in the church down there, and a lot of times I stand outside the door and listen to Daddy pray. He pray for hours at the time. You know, I go in there and pray three minutes, and these four boys slap out. <laughs> that was a long marathon 
one from either time. We come a little ways from that, but it don't matter where you start, it matters that you start, what matters. Amen? It don't matter how it's been, it matters what, what you're going to decide to do today. Where you've got questions, God's got answers, and yes, they're in the Word of God, I'll never disagree with that, but they're also, you find God's answers in prayer. Yes. He said, what I tell you, John 14, 13, and whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Did you know? A lot of people think God's trying to take things from them. It actually glorifies God to answer your prayer. It glorifies God. It magnifies God. When you walk in His blessings, and the church people today think when you do without and struggle and all these kind of things, their humility, if you want to be honest about it, they're the result of disobedience. Now that won't get anybody to dance it, but it's true. I talked to about this Thursday night. We'll get into more later. People that think are things, people that are honoring certain things in the church, the things they're honoring are actually glorifying the devil. It glorifies God when you're blessed. When you walk in the blessings of God. Amen. You got to know if you're sick today. You got to know that it's not God's will. You got to know that that's not what glorifies him. And you got to keep the faith. And this thing will be turned around. And you'll be able to give him the glory, honor, and praise. Amen. Yes, amen. He said in verse 14, if you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you'll ask anything in my name, I'll do it. That's good. 14. If you'll ask anything in my name, I'll do it. What will you do? What if you ask in his name? And that word ask, it doesn't mean ask. Like you and I uh, would think ask, but it also means to pray. It means to require. Another word that it means is to demand. A lot of people understand that. He said, I'm demanding God to do something. No, God's already done something. In essence, you're really demanding Satan to take his hand off the blessings and provision God's already provided for you. Because remember, you're defending from a place of current, present possession. Amen? Every time you say you're not blessed, every time you say you're not going to make it, you're not going over, you're going under, it glorifies the devil and it gives the enemy access into your life. Every time you say, well, I prayed and I thought God heard me, I tried that faith to every time it opens the door for the devil. You don't try God, you don't try Jesus, you don't try faith. It's a life. It's not a two-week obligation. Amen? You stand on the word when it looks good, you stand on the word when it looks bad. God means the same every day. His word means the same every day. It never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Wherever you are tonight, today, the word says in another place, you have not because you ask not. Also says your heavenly father knows those things you have need of even before you ask him. Go to the father in the name of Jesus concerning whatever it is that you need or want today. Amen? There's value in praying with other people. I understand that. But there's also great value and something that you can't skip is just you and him. You can't skip it because you'll not know what to do. Your life and the plan that God has for your life must be prayed out by you. I tell Jay all the time, there's certain things I can do. There's some things that i got authority in his life to a degree as his pastor and his father, and, and I do to a certain degree. But he's got to hear God for his life. He's got to know this bears witness with my spirit. That I know this is right, one or other. I try to help guide him based on what I know, but there's certain things that Jay asked me, and I tell him still to this day, I haven't told you, and I'm not going to tell you, because God has to tell you those things, because those are decisions that you have to live with, not me, the rest of your life. You have to live with the decisions that you make concerning your life. There's four or five or six different things I will tell you. So you pray, and you seek God, and let him tell you. We taught him how to pray and see God. Amen? Amen. He's got to decide. But so do you. So does your children. Amen? Do we want to get God involved? Oh, yeah. Stand to your feet.